Hi everyone, I'm Cassie Megan. Welcome to Unmasked with Cassie Megan podcast. Today we're talking with Frederick about his um, journey with epilepsy and his climb of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, Frederick, would you like to say a bit about yourself? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, um, Cassidy, for inviting me for the, today's chat. And thank you for everyone who has joined already and those that are joining. My name is Frederick Perucci. Um, I'm from Kenya, Africa, uh, Nairobi. I'm an epilepsy awareness activist. And in Kenya, we have the National Epilepsy Coordination Committee, um, which I am the national secretary at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm so happy to have joined this chat today. Um, I'm also a caregiver uh, for a person living with epilepsy. Actually, my sister, her name is Mercy. She's now 14 years old and she was diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of two, but she has been under treatment. And uh, this year, she's doing her fourth year uh, seizure free. It's amazing. What well, year seizure free? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, how was her diagnosis? Well, for my sister, actually, for a long time, we really didn't know what was the cause um, because she started showing symptoms and probably having seizures at the age of uh, two, two and a half years, but we really missed the signs in between. So later, when we took her to a specialist, uh, for the right diagnosis, um, they were able to tell exactly what had caused her uh, some brain damage, and it was cerebral uh, malaria. So uh, basically, that that was what the doctor said could have uh, caused a brain damage, and eventually for her to get epilepsy. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's. Did you find it was difficult at all um, getting the diagnosis or and even hearing the diagnosis? Well, personally, I would say um, uh, growing up, I think I had an opportunity to hear about epilepsy, but I had not really taken uh, so much time to really get to know what is epilepsy all about. So you can imagine by the time that uh, the reality was hitting home, that one of us was having that condition. Actually, it, it wasn't so easy. And it was also equally confusing because I think personally, I was in denial of wanting to accept the fact that uh, something that you've been hearing about and not even thinking that one time uh, you or any of your loved ones could get the condition and it's here with you now and you need to accept that. That was the difficult part, uh, I would say. So um, the reality of the diagnosis really didn't sink in well with me. And later on, I also realized to the rest of my siblings and even my parents, it was really uh, a shock. And again, coming from an area where, cause in Kenya and uh, Nairobi is where I work, but my home area is on the coastal side of Kenya. So the, when you talk of, you know, all these misconceptions and myths about epilepsy, they are so much uh, held there by people and you can imagine now happening in your own village uh, that was really very difficult for us to really accept it's understandable especially if it's not talked a lot about 
you wouldn't really know a lot of people wouldn't really know a lot about it, so it would be hard to educate yourselves and others about it too. I know that stigma can be hard. And you said from a place you didn't really talk about have it a lot open in the open. How did you find the stigma with it was? Um the stigma you mentioned about the stigma, right? Okay, great. Well, um, now that I've mentioned, you know, the area that I, th that we have been born and we have grew up in uh, the coastal side of Kenya, um, the, the stigma is so, is so real because I, I can vividly remember by the time as a family also we were sharing the, the results of the diagnosis with the extended family, uh, like this is what one of us, you know, is having right now. And as a family, we really need that support from uh, the extended family and even, you know, the friends and neighbors close. Um, my sister's seizures were generalized seizures. So, and they were happening before you know, we could really get medicine to control after, like in intervals of 20 minutes, should get, should get a seizure. Um, so uh, to many, that was scary. To many, they didn't even want to get closer to, to her. To many other children, they didn't want to play with her. Um, and if there was a neighbor who appeared to be caring, uh, they would come and they would tell you, can you lock her up because when she's outside here, she would fall down and maybe hurt herself. So even when somebody was giving a statement or when somebody was there to say, um, I feel you and I understand you, really it didn't come out so clear because um, they were not going to say that we want to help you in some way, but uh, they always portray the picture like she should not be around other children because she might end up maybe infecting them or just because sometimes she's in a confusion kind of a state after a seizure um, the other people will take away their children because they feel maybe she can get violent and hurt them or something so it was really uh, very difficult and 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 that uh, the situation in itself uh, was extended even to our local church um, she loves going to church but now going there and when the service is on and then she gets a seizure and it appears like everything has to come to a standstill for her to be looked after so at some point um, this took long for my mom to tell me that at some point she was told not to actually go to church uh, with her or if she decides that she wants to go to church then um, she she must leave our sister back at home um, that, that, that was the last thing I would really want to have heard from my church uh, but again it happened so that tells you that even those that have an opportunity to go to church and be enlightened, they still uh, don't have a very deep understanding about what epilepsy is all about. And so they will always want to uh, shy away from talking about it. I'm so sorry that happened and that you all had to go through that. No one should have to face that kind of of stigma and overall rudeness. Um, I'm so sorry I had to face that. Uh, I just went back in the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, how, are, how are they with you now? Yeah. You're to the community. Well, so you see, over time, um, because the experience of seeing the reaction from um, 
the extended family members, neighbors, and even my community. Uh, at some point, I thought they are reacting this way because maybe they don't have information or they don't know so much about what epilepsy is all about. So for me to um, actually even leave my, my career that I had studied in university first, to take care of my sister was for the same reason that I wanted to prove to them that um, epilepsy is just um, a medical condition that can be uh, managed. So in, in, 20, in 2012, I, I left my career in shipping management and I decided to just go home and sit with my sister and look after her. So there's, there's so much that I learned. I was able to also tell, you know, what kind of seizures, when there was a trigger, how I was able to even tell when a seizure was about to happen because of that time that I had sat down and spent so much time with her. At the same time, I was doing a lot of research, reading a lot of medical research on on epilepsy, um, first aid. I was just getting myself acquainted with a lot of information to understand exactly what this condition was all about. And then now when we finally got a specialist and she was uh, given the right kind of medication that was able to manage the, the, the kind of seizures that she was getting, I, I asked the specialist if I could get an opportunity to learn more about epilepsy so that I could begin now to go to, to schools and even have opportunities in churches and, and community forums to just share with people the basic facts about epilepsy, like what epilepsy is, what epilepsy is not, the myth and misconception, and the first aid. I felt those were the few things that people needed to know first. And when I took that, that initiative to begin talking to people, um, at, at the same time using my sister as an example, because they could clearly see now that the seizures had reduced significantly because of the medication that she was taking at that time. And so it made a big difference. Today, um, um, even in my local village, they they have changed my name as that epilepsy man. So uh, and it's not because I have epilepsy, but they have known me from a point of, uh, in my conversation, the first, the second, and the third sentence, I would have mentioned epilepsy like 10 times already. So yeah, <laughs> it's really making a difference. What, that's amazing that you saved your sister and you learned her triggers and you were able to tell how she was going to have a seizure. Definitely an amazing brother. Um, everything you've done is changing the face of that epilepsy too. And there's just, I'm definitely intrigued to see what else we'll do in the future. Yeah. Um, what gave you the idea to climb Mount Kilimanjaro for awareness? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cassidy, for that question. Actually, you see now, after leaving my career in shipping and really uh, beginning to be so passionate about creating awareness and just share the knowledge about epilepsy with people. That gave me a total uh, turn of my focus and what I really felt I should be doing now. Um, so I went, I went back to the university to study theology. And um, when I finished, I proceeded also to do counseling, uh, psychology. And basically counseling because over time I was 
looking at my mom uh, taking care of our sister and sometimes it was too much for her and she couldn't really be able to keep up with the situation at that point in time and slowly she was going deep into depression without her knowing because she's the first person who experiences uh, or sees our sister going into a seizure every other day Sorry? I'm not sure who's I was on there's a siren going um oh yeah sorry um okay I'm um, I'm in the office and I think there's a an ambulance passing by okay I was not sure no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My office is close to the to the national hospital here, so there are many cases coming in. I, I, I'm not sure what that could have caused, really, or been. Yeah. Okay. Um. Is, is it okay? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, at first, I recommended that mom. I recommended to my mom to go for counselling um, because she couldn't really tell what was happening to her. But I could be able to tell a little bit that she was being overwhelmed by the whole situation that was happening at that moment. And she took a couple of counselling sessions, and that really made her come back to to herself. Um, and uh, and continue to support our sister so from that point then i realized this is one of the things that i was meant to do um, educating people about epilepsy and because i cannot always go to schools or seek opportunities to go into churches and talk to people i resulted to now using the mainstream media um, and I started a, a radio show, a local on a local community radio, uh, to sensitize people about uh, epilepsy on different topics every Sunday. And then, over and over again, I was able to get an opportunity um, to write to be a writer with a, a a magazine here in Kenya. It's called E Woman Magazine. Um, to specifically have a column about epilepsy. Um, uh, then over time again, I realized that uh, if we could be creative enough to come up with events that would really be able to pull people together in terms of them not only coming for the event, but getting an opportunity to learn about epilepsy, it will still be good. So in 20, 16 i started an event it's called epilepsy afro fashion fair so basically epilepsy afro fashion fair africa is rich in terms of um, um what do i say like clothes design and we have um, people who want to do um, uh, modeling and trying to take the runway so the whole idea came in because most people think that persons living with epilepsy cannot participate, say, in a fashion uh, and modeling event. Every time they take the runway, everyone is on the edge of the seat thinking that they will get a seizure along the way and they trip. When the fact that uh, is most of them want to explore their talent, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in um, uh, it's in modeling and, and anything like that. So we created that platform and we would have different people coming and showcasing different designs, Africa print design in terms of the kind of dresses that they have created and that people here love uh, events that do a lot of fashion and art and they would come not only to watch but to also get information about epilepsy then over time for myself I thought I could also start expeditions like after every two years I do a major expedition to create awareness about epilepsy so in 2018 
my first expedition was to walk a distance of 482 kilometers. That was from Nairobi to, to the coastal town of Kenya, which is called Mombasa. It took me 12 days to do that, but it created a lot of awareness across the country and it attracted a lot of media attention. From the success of that, I thought I could not just sit down and not do another expedition. So I came up with a structure of how I will be doing the expeditions after every two years. So the last one happened in 2018, the walk, and this year um, I'm climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Apparently the tallest in Africa, and it has the tallest uh, standing peak in the world um, uh, and not so many people actually have an opportunity to to do the climbing it's it's dangerous uh, and I think that's what makes it very special also when it comes to somebody who decides to climb but to make it more of a challenge I'm not only climbing but um, I'm cycling all the way to Kilimanjaro um, uh, and the cycling will take me five days, a distance of 328 kilometers. Um, so I'll be cycling and then rest for two days and then climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So climbing Mount Kilimanjaro takes, uh, takes you seven days. So it's five days up to the peak and then two days coming down. Um, so, and the overall goal here is to first uh, uh, rally the international, the regional, and the local media to shout about epilepsy. So the, last week and this week, we've really had an opportunity to be invited in so many uh, media uh, institutions and media houses, televisions and radio to talk about the journey which is Kilimanjaro that that's where the conversation about epilepsy comes in because if somebody asks you why would you cycle all the way to Kilimanjaro when you can take a flight you tell them you want to make it a challenge because you want to meet a lot people along the way and tell them about epilepsy um, um, and the other objective is to see how best we can be able to um, um, uh, create user-friendly messages. You know, Africa has has um, uh, assorted languages, and people really get to understand their local languages more than when you have one universal language that you are trying to 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 make a communication uh, over. So, what we want to do is in the different languages that Africa uh, speaks. We want to create messages about epilepsy for them to read and understand in their own indigenous languages. So that's part of um, the objective that we also want to, to create. And finally, to just synergize. There are so many other people here in Kenya who are doing a lot of epilepsy work. It could be research, it could be awareness, you know, it could be treatment because they are either neurology um, uh, hospital or something. But uh, they, there isn't a platform where they can be brought together and, and, and have one voice. So um, one of the objectives for this expedition is to bring all stakeholders who are doing epilepsy management and care in one way or another to to see how best we can have an opportunity to push the agenda uh, forward as well. That's amazing. Um, I love how you're going to bring everyone together in this journey and this challenge. Um, mm. And your idea of like, showing like how versatile a place can be, and like whether it's languages or anything it's just amazing to see that you're doing that and how long do you say the cycle was for the cycling will take us five days 
and then the claim and the climbing will take us seven days okay wow so is it just you doing that um cyclone and climb or is there people with you um there are people with me i was able to um, approach a few professional cyclists so that they can be pacemakers for me. Uh, I'm not a professional cyclist, but I have been preparing for this expedition uh, for a year now. Um, I have done I have done about close to 400 kilometers in cycling during my preparation. So uh, we are we will be six of us and two. Two of those professional cyclists are, um, are young people living with epilepsy um, because I wanted to also, you know, it, it, it's about epilepsy and so for it to really reflect that the whole thing is about epilepsy, uh, I, I made it open to people living with epilepsy but they have stabilized in terms of them, uh, you know, now not experiencing uh, uh, seizures and they are able to take up such challenges uh, for them to inspire others. So we are six of us who will be cycling. Not all of us who are cycling will be climbing. So out of the six, three will be uh, doing the climb. It's good. Not doing it alone just because I mean, everything's safer with at least one other person. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that it, you'll have others with you. And that sounds amazing that you have a team going, coming along with you to help you make even more of an impact. Um, are you still doing like, the fashion shows and all that? Yeah, so, so this year, because since 2016, every year we've been doing the fashion event and this year, because we couldn't really have a big event uh, because of the restrictions from COVID, what we are doing after we are back from Kilimanjaro, we will be doing um, um, we will be doing a photo shoot with the with the models, um, uh, and this will be uh, the photo shoot for for the for fashion. Will be will be doing it as as we build up for international epilepsy uh, day which is in february 8th i think yeah so once we come back as we wrap up the year we we have already scheduled a, a photo shoot with the different um, uh, models who will be showcasing different designs um of course they're african design but but because we want them to have a feel of epilepsy, every design, whether it's it's a, it's a dress, it's a skirt, it's a suit, we, we tell the designers to give it a touch of purple um, so that at the end of the day, it, it brings the, it, 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 I mean, it brings the, ep the epilepsy awareness picture out. Yeah, so we will not have a big, a uh, fashion event as we've been doing it in the in the past years but we will be having a photo shoot with the with the with the models for epilepsy that's yeah. that's amazing like, i'm a professional model so i understand that like i understand that i mean as a model in person with epilepsy i appreciate what you're doing for every everyone and that yeah. you're putting purple in with your uh, environments that's made in India. Um, like people like watching it possible. Like, if you like stream it, if you I'd love to watch it. Um, and maybe we could do something together on uh, March 26th as well. Um, maybe like another for a purple day. And something for purple day. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. I, yeah, sure. Um, uh, for Purple Day, like this year, uh, what we did, um, there's a there's a there's a company here. So in in 
in Kenya, the I think the tallest the tallest building in East Africa uh, is here in Nairobi. It's called the UAP UAP Old Mutual Tower. Um, yeah. So in March March twenty sixth this year, actually that was my that was my last major event to do because thereafter the first case for coronavirus was announced here in Kenya. But I was able to host an event during the March 26 Purple Day, and uh, we were privileged to actually light that UAP Tower Building Purple on the 26th of March. Um, and it was such an epic event because it the, the building is right in the middle of the city, and it really attracted a lot of attention and that had never happened before uh, the building i think is about eight years old since it since it was constructed and it was such an, an awesome uh, event the management really uh, supported us in 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 lighting up that building purple and uh, we were able to get uh, a few dignitaries coming um, a few other stakeholders and organizations for an evening event as we uh, we were lighting that building purple. So uh, later on, I still went back to the management and told them, you know, epilepsy, uh, the purple day happens every year, 26th of March, and we would love that every every year we do an event of light of not only lighting that building purple but also incorporating other activities to to make to mark the day in a big way and they accepted that so right now we have already started a conversation with them about next year because i think 26 uh march is i mean give or take two months in two months time so and i love really trying to put things together early in advance to to avoid um any um any mistakes in between so that conversation has already started uh, apart from lighting the building purple on 26 march 2021 uh we have so many other act, uh, events and activities we are planning around Amazing. Um, if I can help at all, let me know. I would love to. Um, yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. But what is the date that you guys start the cycling and the date of the climb? Oh, great. So, um, actually, I think I'm left with about four days at most, four or five. Um, so next week on Monday, we will be having our final press conference with the, with the media uh, together with the cycling team um, uh, at, the, at the Bank of Africa headquarters because it's here in Kenya, the, the Bank of Africa HQ is in Kenya. So we approached them and told them because we want to, this expedition is about creating awareness in Africa and it would resonate well with them because they are a banking institution that also represents Africa. So they gave us that opportunity to do the press conference there. Um, it will be a press conference of about one and a half or two hours. And we have extended the invite to so many other media houses to come over. And then uh, later on, that day, we will be meeting uh, with the cycling team in a, in a hotel uh, along the route which we shall be using now to, to cycle. So we are looking forward to start our cycling on 17th, um, very early in the morning. We will be leaving Nairobi at around 5 a.m. Um, on our first day of cycling so every day we are trying to cover 
a hundred kilometers every day. That's the target. We want to cover a hundred kilometers every day before the sun sets. Yeah. And I want to believe that we, we will be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so we are starting on 17, the cycling, and then we anticipate that by, by 21st or 22nd, we would have crossed over to Tanzania. Um, we will rest for two days and begin our climbing by 24th or 25th. Amazing. of November. And what yeah. time is the press conference on Monday? Sorry? What time is the press conference on Monday? Yeah, the press conference on Monday will be from um, 9, sorry, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Amazing. Yeah, 9 a.m. Kenyan time. That's 9 a.m. Kenyan time. Um, how can people, can people join? Um, virtually to the, uh, the press conference yeah. or to watch your journey um, just like in the climb. How can people join and support your challenge? Well, thank you so much. So actually to participate in, in, in this activity, beginning with the press conference, um, I know there are media houses that will be hosting the press conference live on their uh, televisions or maybe radio stations, um, um, and I know most of uh, most of those media houses have uh, uh, live streaming uh, online services. So maybe what I'll do, I'll just share the links of where people can be able to to view the conference. But we also, I also have a very uh, um, a strong media team that is helping us to, uh, you know, do updates every other day. Uh, once we start, okay, the, the updates have been on even before uh, we begin our our journey, uh, but it will be more intense now by the time we we start the journey. So, um, uh, what I will do. I will share the, all the social media links because the press conference will also be posted live on our Facebook page, uh, Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel. So uh, to just give people an opportunity to have a feel and an experience of what will be happening. Uh, in terms of support, we, we have a link for, um, on GoFundMe platform. Um, uh, that's the link that we've been uh, also using and sharing with friends and partners who would wish to support the the expedition in one way or another. I can as well, you know, forward that link for anyone who feels that they might want to to support in one way or another. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'd love to. If you can send me the link so I can help, hope so I can share them and hopefully bring more people to watching it. Yeah, sure. Does anyone else have any questions for Frederick? Laura, you have a question? Yeah, Laura, ask first. You should unmute yourself first. Then I'm gonna go to Lula. What was your question, Laura? Um, we don't really have a question. I just think it's great to get up four o'clock in the morning to be able to hear somebody around the world talk about their epilepsy experience and what they're doing. It's just really great. So thank you, Frederick. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. okay. Um, and your question? Yeah, I have a question. So, um, Frederick, how's the medication accessibility in Africa? Oh, uh, great. The medication. Um, well, I, I should say, honestly, um, uh, we still have a challenge in terms of uh, medication here because uh, uh, most of the medication that works for so many people is is being imported, and it's uh, it's very expensive. What the government is able to 
um, what the government is able to offer um, at the moment is uh, phenobarbital and neurotrol, which I don't know if it's the nature of the different types of epilepsy that people have here, but most of the time it has not really worked for so many people and it turns out to be very expensive for them to now get the other uh, kind of medication that might probably be working out for them. So uh, because I have an opportunity to sit at the National Epilepsy Coordination Committee that basically advises the government on, uh, on issues of policy and what really uh, might be working for in terms of the first line drugs that the government need to procure for the uh, public hospitals. We have really tried to uh, come up with uh, the, the National Epilepsy Management Guideline and shared with the relevant uh, ministries for them to see if they can adapt and begin to stock uh, uh, such uh, drugs or medication um, in the public hospitals. So basically that's what we are trying to do right now. Excellent. Um, and Demendra, you had a question? Yeah, I have one question to ask. So I think uh, you talk about the phenofibrate, which is the very basic drug which is available in the African country. But how do you... Uh, the, what we have seen from India, there are a lot of companies who are very active, particularly in Nairobi, Kenya, this part of the African countries, and they are doing a lot of aggressive marketing. So how do you see the support from these pharma companies, even though there the price for the drugs are not too expensive? Only thing, mm. the, the government, what I feel some regulations are there probably that makes them to inhibit their marketing. Otherwise, we see a lot of aggressive marketing from the Indian pharmaceutical particularly all the African countries. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the pharma support, particularly Indian or for that matter, any multinational company support to the population, wide population of the African people? Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, so, um, so to respond to that question about um, um, what the role that maybe pharmaceuticals are doing? Uh, the, 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 they are a very important. Uh, they are very important stakeholders in in terms of uh, the epilepsy care here, and we really try to bring them on board every other time we are having uh, forums or meetings within the national epilepsy uh, board and their contributions have been more on trying to enlighten and uh, 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 giving awareness in terms of the range of medication that is there for epilepsy. Uh, so many people have been a little bit uh, rigid in trying to in trying to um, uh, uh, incorporate other other medicines apart from the traditional ones that, as you've mentioned, because phenobab um, is is a drug that has been here for so long uh, in in Africa, and of course it has been seen to work for different kind of um, of seizures, uh, but over time we realize that other different kind of seizure types that maybe cannot be controlled with the, with the phenobab. So the pharmaceuticals companies, what they are doing is trying to introduce uh, these new products to people. And of course, as I had mentioned, they are a bit expensive, but they're drugs that really work out so well. Uh, what we are trying to do now is to see how best can we then come up with policies that will make these drugs available and accessible in terms of um, somebody will not miss out on them because they are expensive.
because I believe if we've ended up getting uh, drugs that are working well uh, for different seizure types, then somebody should not be limited to getting what is uh, right for them. So I know it's not going to be a one day thing to really try and see how best we can be able to uh, uh, make uh, everyone be able to get drugs uh, like availability and accessibility. But um, because this conversation has started and we have a body that is helping to pull people together, I'm very sure even the pharmaceutical companies are going to uh, uh, support uh, the, the agenda moving forward. Very nice uh, uh, solution you have given, sir. Uh, uh, what we have experienced for last two years, the Indian pharmaceutical companies, they really become very aggressive, particularly all mm. the African countries. So like newer drugs like Levacetron, Sinusamide, it is also they are getting newer entries to the African mm. countries. Phenofibrate, no doubt, is the, one of the best drugs, but only thing for a prolonged use, it gives a lot of scar marks, bleeding problem on the faces and the part. So sure. that is mm. what, it, it, the, the drug has gone behind. But we see mm. a very good support from the uh, African government because their regulations are also supporting to the Indian pharmaceutical companies. Mm. So mm. we see a good opportunity in terms of making available the new drugs particularly like mm. across the, all the state. So thank you very much for your, for your conversation. Thank you. Really yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I guess another question I had was if you had to give a piece of advice to somebody who has epilepsy or who is now like newly diagnosed, what would it be? Um, well, I, I, I think for me is, I, I would advise that person based on the experience that I have gone through. And one of the things would be uh, acceptance uh, first. And I know that that's okay. It, it might sound really easy to just say acceptance because I would tell you for a fact, uh, for me, um though i wasn't the one who was diagnosed with epilepsy but because it was a very close uh you know sibling it was not easy for me to also accept but over time i realized that acceptance is the first thing that we need to really hold on um and and you know make a decision so long as as long as the diagnosis has been done and it's right and the results are out, then uh, we should ac uh, accept that. And number two, um, um, get yourself uh, knowledgeable about that condition. I mean, it, it does not just stop at, okay, I've been diagnosed with a certain condition, so that's it. I'm waiting to be told this is your clinic day, this is your medication, this is your... As you grow up, I think you just have to develop um, an interest of being able to want to always learn about that condition because you end up not only helping yourself with that knowledge, but also helping others uh, with that kind of knowledge um, that you have. And uh, finally, and I, this is one of my strongest, is what um, epilepsy is, I mean, should not limit you from wanting to do whatever you think uh, you have been created to do. Like, uh, you should live up to the purpose of what you think you have been created to do and not be limited by uh, this condition that has epilepsy. There's a friend of mine who loves saying that uh, uh, epi 
I have epilepsy, but epilepsy doesn't have me, and it <laughs> it makes a lot of uh, difference because that is to say you have every you have every opportunity to take control over and and for not and not epilepsy to take control over over you yeah so I, I would just want to encourage anyone who is out there um and and you have epilepsy it's your first time i understand the confusion i understand that you need to you feel like you need to restructure your life all together and and try to find a different path of which it will work with that condition i understand all that but it shouldn't be something that will kill your dreams or make you feel like it's it's the end of the world i i am seeing my sister now you know developing interest over so many things that we felt she could not do um sometimes i take a lot of time before i go home to see her but the other day dad sent me a video of her mom was cooking and she was at the dishwasher uh, helping mom to wash the dishes and it was it was amazing because it's something that we we had not seen her do for quite some time so she's really living up her life as a as a a brilliant girl as a very hopeful girl purposefully for her life in what she really wants to achieve and and i mean i mean that's what we would love to see for anyone who really feels they are limited in one way or another but ready to live a full, to the full potential of what they think uh, life has for them that's amazing um can you actually when places that I would love to visit someday and if I ever get that chance I would love to do some work with you and your sister in person and meet your sister in here hear her story from her yeah. as well you guys sound like an amazing family amazing people um yeah and very supportive brother um I'm so honored that you Sorry, I'm so honored that you have <laughs> done as much as you are a Purple Day ambassador and are part of the Purple Day team and family and everything you have done coming on here to share with us and tell your story is just is amazing. Um, I'm so glad. Thank you for doing this interview and you are very inspirational that is for sure and thank you so much for agreeing to do this and for answering all of our questions um, <laughs> thank you thank you too cassidy i mean you for you to also create such a platform of connecting people from all over the world to just share experiences and i mean share these stories it's an amazing thing that you are doing so 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 much i appreciate the opportunity to share yeah thank you so much thank you um you remind me actually a lot of my brother and so it's uh, very sweet um do you have any last words you would like to add in or that i didn't ask about uh, or, well my yeah like my final words would be I mean, I think more than ever now, I'm realizing that I needed so much of, um, uh, I, I think I found a purpose to, um, I found a purpose to life. And one of it is to create awareness about epilepsy. Um, when we, when we are alive, we look forward to doing so many other great things in life. Uh, you you find yourself getting into so many other things, trying to find what exactly you were created for. And for me, I think I found that purpose. Uh, the other day when I was doing my interview, I think yesterday, the presenter was asking me, so uh, what's the future plan? And I told them that I'm looking forward to do um an expedition after every two years 
until I am 50. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that is to say I have like another 12 expeditions to do <laughs> or 13, I'm not sure, but, but that's what I want to do. I want to do expeditions um, after every two years until I'm 50. And they will be for no any other reason but to create awareness about epilepsy. If along the line I get to inspire others to, to pick it up when I will not have the strength to do that, to walk for 12 days maybe. I'm not sure if I'll do that when I'm 50, but, <laughs> but I, I will try. <laughs> I will try to do different things to really see how they can create awareness. And every other person has an opportunity to. You might not do a bigger thing of climbing the mountain, but you can do a thing of inviting somebody like me to have a conversation with different people. And in equal measure, that really makes a, a big difference. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would love to join on one of these adventures one day. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you so much again for doing this live um, interview with us. And thank you everyone for joining in, watching, asking some questions as well. It was very inspirational to hear, a very inspirational for amb ambassador. And I wish you all the best on this Mount Kilimanjaro challenge. And I'll be mm -hmm. following you as much as I can with that. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, if you if you can hear my voice, can I ask a question? Yes, definitely you can ask a question. Like uh, in Africa, if you see the number of neurologists are very less. So the primary care of epilepsy treatment, sometimes may be done by psychiatrist or sometimes by the family physician. So is it true in African countries or purely oh. it is managed by the neurologist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, what is happening here is we don't have so many neurologists, neither do we have uh, the epileptologists. With, uh, in Kenya, we only have two epilepsy specialists that I know um, who are referred as the epileptologists. And for neurologists, if the number has ever increased from the one that I knew, there are not more than 25 of them. Yeah, so over time, what has happened is the, the clinical officer or the medical officer who are not really specialized in neurology or epilepsy have had to be trained on how they can be able to diagnose and also treat epilepsy. Um, because if we end up relying on the few neurologists that we have, then um, so many people will not get opportunities to get proper um, uh, management of, of epilepsy. So it's, it's really still a challenge here, but I hope over time people will be interested to study neurology or epilepsy so that the numbers can increase over time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your answer. Um, Lori said, I've added Frederick and Nemanja to my Twitter social, you inspire smiling. Um, thank you so much for all this guys, all your questions, um, sharing your story, Frederick. I wish everyone, yeah. I wish you all the best with your journey and the challenge and definitely stay in contact. Um, yeah. yeah. And if there's anything we can do to help, please let me know. I would love to help out in any way. I guess we're all done. So we will talk soon. Um, I'll get editing on this today. Um, yeah, I will, I will share the links of all the social media and everything that, yeah, I will. Okay, thank you, everyone. Take care. We'll Great. talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for your nice presence. I feel stronger than before. I'm not alone anymore. I look up and you are there. The stars are everywhere. Our lights are shining bright. Filling up the night
like anyone 